Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this second webinar by PSM. Um, today's topic is on the porphyry copper gold deposits of Southeast Asia, and with a particular focus on the geotechnical modeling for pit slope design. Um, my name is Mark Higgins. I'm a principal at PSM, um, and I've been working on these uh, deposits for the last 35 odd years. So, um, uh, we'll get straight straight into it. Here we go. What do these uh, porphyry copper open pits look like? Well, this is the Panguna open pit in Bougainville, in PNG. This is the uh, Bata Hijau open pit in Indonesia in the island of Zimbabwe. This is the Grassberg Papa uh, pit in the province of Papua in Indonesia. And the last one here is Octeti and PNG. So you can see straight away in these open pits that they're quite large structures, upwards of a thousand meters in depth. Um, and I like to think that they can be considered some of the greatest engineered structures in the world, given their size and complexity. They typically occur in very dynamic physical settings and in com complex geological environments. So how do we actually go about undertaking this slope design challenge? The, really, the key messages for today are understanding that the geology is the main control on the rock mass behavior and also its role in uh, controlling slope and stability mechanisms that we need to consider in design. So really the challenge here is, how do we go about understanding that rock mass behavior? How do we go about understanding and identifying those mechanisms? And the, and, and the answer to that question is the geotechnical model. This is the our slope design process flowchart that we like to use at PSM. So it starts off with the, I'll just uh, put the presentation mode on. Where is it? Pointer options, here we go. So it starts off with the site investigation of leading into the model development, and then the analysis and, and design, and then the slope management tasks. It's just in a very brief, uh, flow through and what that design process is. What I want to do today is focus on the model development part of that design process. So we're looking at the geotechnical model, the different components of the model, and then it, towards the end, I'll make some comments about how that impacts on uh, the critical failure mechanisms that are should be taken into account for design. Now, why, why have I chosen to talk about this? Is because if the model is a flawed or an incomplete or not quite right, then those areas will be taken forward into analysis. And then we then have a risk that an inappropriate design takes place. So really it's, it's about getting this top process correct and getting, those, uh, getting the geotechnical model as accurate as we possibly can given the complexity of, of the, um, the setting that we're working in here. I'd like to start, um, before we get into the model components for a porphyry or epithermal style deposit, I just want to review a little bit about the different types of engineering geological models that we need to take into account um, when we are doing design for these porphyry and epithermal style deposits now. The other thing I meant to mention is really the systems and processes that we and comments I'm making today is not necessarily just relevant for open pit slope design, but it's also uh, very usable and, and relevant for underground mining, in particular in cave, um, block cave and sublevel cave type um, underground mine types. So these concepts are equally applicable to those um, to that to that those mining systems. The, the first type of model is the conceptual model. 
Now, the conceptual model is not a real model in space. It, it provides us a concept of what we might be able to anticipate. So it's a really, it's quite a theoretical and notional model. When we base that model on our past knowledge and experience um, in these types of settings. And I'll hopefully be able to convince you by the end of this talk that this concept and the use of the conceptual model is actually critical to um, improving the accuracy of our overall geotechnical model. The, the second type of model is an observational model. Now, this is where we're actually starting to collect data from our site investigation. We're now trying to provide a real representation of what the geotechnical conditions are like in space and time. So we're constraining that information in space and time. So that really the key, the key words here in the conceptual model where it's about anticipating what's, what's, uh, what we're going to encounter in the rock mass, whereas the observation of models about constraining in, in space and time. The, moving on to the components of the model. So this is a quite a messy diagram. There's a lot of information here, but we'll just concentrate on some key elements of the diagram. On the left-hand side here, we have the conceptual model uh, leading down into the observational model, um, which can be uh, initial, an initial model that might be developed in early stages of the um, mine planning process through to detailed stages, uh, a detailed model once we get towards execution and um, actually um, start of mining. The start of the process up here with the conception model is about very early on, particularly during those scoping level studies that, uh, to develop that big picture setting. So by, by that, I mean looking at the global tectonic setting of the deposit uh, in particular, as I'll show you in a minute, what, where the project sits relative to the, next, the nearest play boundary. And then moving down in scale uh, to more detailed, looking at the regional to district scale setting. And that helps us with the conception model and, and provides a framework in which we can then start planning our investigation to then um, develop our observational model. Once we undertake that investigation, we can start compiling that observational model. And the major components of that model is the geology, the, the structure, the rock mass, and the hydrogeology. Now, Tim, in that first uh, webinar that we gave, Tim Sullivan talked about hydromechanical coupling. So really that deals a lot with the hydrogeology elements of the model development. What I wanna to cover today is particularly around about the geology structure and the rock mass and how that relates to the porphyry and epithermal um, geology. Now, a key part of this model development is the, um, the geological model. And in particular, this, this component here Piecing together the geological history of the project area is, is uh, a fundamental part of the model development. And it's, in my experience, something that's not very well done in, in uh, geotechnical practice for mining, but it really is provides that um, LinkedIn with the global setting and a big picture understanding provides the basis for us to be able to make those judgment calls that uh, we always need to make um, when trying to fill these gaps and uncertainties in these complex settings. The last step in the um, part of the model development is, is, is part of the simplification process. So when we start that modeling process, we need to be able to set out a list of key questions that the model must address. It's all to do with what, we, what the engineering project's about. So then we need to simplify each of these main components of the model to answer those key engineering questions that must be dealt with in analysis and design. So a bit more about that model development process. So we start off with the conceptual model and gaining that big picture understanding, that global tectonic setting and that regional to district scale setting. And then that allows us to design the, an efficient 
investigation program. Um, it sets up a series of hypotheses and questions in which the detailed observational model should be addressing. And these are the four main components of the model, the geology, structure, rock mass, and hydrogeology. And when we're presenting that model, there are four main areas that uh, the model uh, should be presenting. We should be, it's about understanding those controlling geological factors for each of the different components of the model. It's about undertaking engineering, geological or geotechnical characterization of the different rock mass units and the different structure types. It's about the visualization, the spatial distribution, whether it be in 2D section or a 3D um, geological model. And the last step that really turns it from an engineering geological model into a geotechnical model is parameterization, starting to put properties around the different rock mass units and different structure types. Now, the, the key part of this diagram here is that as we, we first develop our conventional model, um, ideally during that scoping level study, as we go through each phase of the mine development process from pre-feasibility to feasibility to execution, at each of those stages, we feed back what we found in those investigations back into the conceptual model. It's a, um, it then allows us to reframe those questions, test those hypotheses, and if we didn't get it quite right, then we can reframe those questions in it's a way of uh, improving the quality and the accuracy of the model. So that's what I mean by the, the conceptual model actually forms a very key part of our um, overall process of developing our ge geotechnical model. So what I wanna talk about for the rest of the talk is that particularly about porphyry and epithermal style deposits. I'm gonna talk about the regional to district scale geological setting and also the deposit scale factors. So for the big picture, I'm talking about plate tectonics, volcanic and magmatic arcs, about the tectonics and major structures that we can expect at the deposit scale. Well, and, and the bigger scale was particularly about uh, helping set up our conceptual model. Our deposit scale factors that I want to talk about is about brecciation, alteration and weathering and structure. And, those components really make up the bulk of the observational model. And then we'll provide a, a couple of quick examples of what a rock mass model might look like, what a structural model might look like, and then uh, some final comments on um, slope and stability mechanisms uh, from a survey of a pit that we undertook in Indonesia. So let's start with the big picture setting first. So here's a map of the Southeast Asia, and I've, here I've labeled on number of porphyry and epithermal deposits. Um, this is not exhaustive. There's plenty of others around Southeast Asia. Most of these we have had some association with in, in past years, and uh, that's kind of why I've identified them, because they're the ones I'm most familiar with. So if I superimpose on top of that, the plate tectonic model. So this map shows where the nearest plate boundaries are. The red dots show where the nearest, where those um, deposits were located. And quite clearly there, you can see that there's a strong relationship of these uh, deposits with these convergent plate boundaries, these subduction systems. And then if we look at the different types of uh, um, crust, so the yellow is the Australian continental crust. The green is the Eurasian continental crust. And it's the pink areas we're particularly interested in. Though these are the magmatic arcs. Um, and clearly, again, you can see that these deposits are very clearly linked to these magmatic and volcanic arcs. So there's a very clear relationship of these deposits to these different, to this particular tectonic setting. Now, we're all familiar with these uh, typical subduction zone settings with these uh, subducting plate um, uh, and the melting of the subducting plate and the generation of the, the, the uh, plutonic activity and the volcanic activity. So these 
are the settings in which these uh, porphyrin epithermal style deposits are located in these uh, magmatic and overlying volcanic arcs. And typically you'll find that these porphyry deposits are located in this, these sorts of areas. Um, they span that geological environment between plutonic and volcanic um, uh, settings. And, and then broadly, we can say that these, uh, these, these uh, settings for these deposits are, are, are contractional. And that means that we're getting processes like crustal thickening occurring, uh, associated uplift in that overriding plate. And then for to make our um, deposit accessible, we need an unroofing event. Um, and those unroofing events are actually quite important to not only to, to the economic viability or that we can actually reach it, but also it's a, a critical part of um, changing the stress conditions and the rocks we're trying to engineer in. Now, um, an equally important factor of these subduction zone systems is that these volcanic arcs are very active and they generate large quantities of sediment. So we have um, this sediment being transported into um, all sides of that volcanic arc. We can get four arc basins, inter arc basins, and back arc basins where these sediments and volcanoclastic materials are accumulating. And they form an important part of the um, geological setting in which these deposits are located. In these, um, looking at this big scale setting, looking at um, where these porphyry systems develop relative to the subduction system. So we can, there's these types of models available to help us guide uh, our understanding. And uh, it, these porphyry style deposits pretty much form in very restricted structural settings. So if the subducting and overriding plate are in compression, we tend to find that these R parallel structures that generate this volcanism are, are quite restricted. So the, the penetration of magma from the um, subducting plate is restricted. And this has placed limitations on these melts being assimilated, stored, and homogenized, these mash processes that the um, geologists talk about. So this is not the ideal structural setting for the generation of porphyry systems. In, in other plate boundary types, we can get these, both the subducting and overriding plate in extension. And this kind of does the opposite thing. It kind of allows increased permeability of these melts into the upper crust and such that um, uh, we got elevated and increased permeability. And these melts are extruded rather than being mashed. So they don't generate the right chemistry in the, uh, the melt mix to generate these deposits. The most ideal setting for these porphyry systems is something in between, is what we call transpression or transtension, where we have some relaxation of those compressive stresses. So it allows us the mash process to occur. Um, and these deposits often form in these fault jogs or structural intersections, which are generated by these um, transpression, transpressional or more optimally, these transtensional strain settings along these arc parallel structures. So the upshot of this is that these deposits often form on strike slip systems or along major fault intersections like um, pull apart basins and transverse fault structures. So these, these sorts of models are very ideal for trying to set up that big picture understanding on what if we understand the large scale structure and setting of our deposit, then it gives us some ideas on the types of major structures and settings that we could expect it. Um, so this, we can now put down, start putting down a list of questions. Uh, and this is the power of the conceptual model was about putting down a set of questions in which the observational model should be addressing. Questions like where is the deposit position relative to the overall convergent plate boundary model? 
what and where are the ad adjacent components of that uh, associated subduction system? Are there any associated volcanic uh, or sedimentary materials that occur relative to that erosion or post mineralization events? What is the uplift in erosional history? How does this fit in with the intrusion and the mineralization and the volcation, uh, volcanism and the sedimentation events? And in here, we really need to look out for these patio surfaces and unconformities that can form uh, in these settings, which uh, represent major discontinuities in the rock mass. And the last question is around the tectonic architecture of the related subduction systems. And how does this control the, the next scale down, the district scale geological structures? So moving down into the deposit scale complexity, um, this is, Silito was a major worker in these porphyry systems, and this is one of his publications from 2010. Um, and it provides um, a schematic of the, the different types of materials that we can expect to see in these uh, porphyry style deposits. So we have our subvolcanic basement. In this case, in this hypothetical example, he has um, a corporate horizon identified. And this, um, then there's an overlying volcanic in shallow intrusive sequence, but the volcanics comprising by flavas and, and torsal or tophaceous sediments. And these form the host rocks to the deposit. Then we have a precursor pluton at depth, um, which is related to the melting of the subducting plate. And then we have the porphyry stock that comes in as part of that pluton intrusion event that comes higher up into the, um, to the crust. And then we can often have these diatreme style eruption events occurring uh, associated with this, uh, this uh, magnetism and um, and that's important because these diatreme events are um, add another complexity in terms of the brecciation types we can expect. So I think the message there really is that these porphyrin and epithermal style events uh, uh, deposits are, are very complex. Um, and it's the role of the engineering geology to unravel their complexity really to unravel it to identify the important elements that are likely to impact on mine design. So the common features that we're looking for here is it's kind of a given that lithology and rock type is, is a key control, but overprinting that we have a number of other factors, particularly the nature and occurrence of different types of bridges. So bridges are a particular um, uh, rock type that occurs in these porphyry and epithermal systems. The next one is how alteration impacts on the rock mass conditions. The fourth is the weathering and how that impacts our, is a, normally as a late event at the top of the system. And the last is the role of the, the structure and how that changes the rock mass conditions. So we're going to go through each of these elements now, the bridges, the alteration, the weathering and, and structure. Brecciation first. So these hydrothermal processes related to these porphyry systems produce a range of different rock textures. They can uh, be anything from a vein dominated systems to breccia dominated systems. And that contributes to the uh, very characteristic fractured and brecciated nature of these um, of the rocks that we encounter in these porphyry systems. And this is important to us because these breccia systems produce relatively poorer quality rock mass. So we need to understand the distribution of these breaches and the types of these breaches. And uh, there are many types of breaches that can form in these geological settings from magmatic hydrothermal breaches, hydromagmatic hydrothermal breaches, breaches associated with the intrusion process, with the volcanic process. And then the last is the, the fault breaches. Now these um, Corbett and Leach are, are also big workers in these porphyry systems. And they've got some very nice um, conceptual diagrams showing these different 
breccia um, types and how they form. So these magmatic hydrothermal breaches, they occur at deeper levels in the system and they're related with uh, sudden uh, uh, explosion of fluids, the generation of hydro hydraulic fracturing and they, they're quite a catastrophic um, events um, producing significant fragmentation of the rock mass. Uh, so these um, uh, hydraulic fracturing processes are quite important in generating these types of breaches that we need to be able to identify in the rock mass. They can um, cause uh, incipient fractures to, to form as the, at the start of the process through to the, the development of uh, hydro fractured breccia, which is in, includes the development of the matrix material due to the milling of the rock as the, um, as the hydro fracturing process continues. And then often we have um, another flush of alteration come through the system uh, causing uh, some annealing and self-sealing of the, of the breccia. Another type of uh, hydrothermal breccia is the hydromagmatic breaches. So these occur typically towards the upper levels of the system. This is where the, um, we've got interaction of the magma with the groundwater or the surface water producing these uh, freomagmatic eruptions. Um, so when we're trying to describe these different types of breaches, there are a number of um, different key characteristics that we need to be able to uh, recognize in the rock mass uh, when we're doing our logging and our mapping. We still need to map the coherent rock and we use our typical um, logging systems, looking at rock type, alteration, grain characteristics, internal structure and fabric. Um, that's a very typical way of describing the rock for um, our coherent rock. However, the, these types of descriptions aren't adequate. They're not sufficient to be able to capture all the elements of a brecciated rock. So we can come up, uh, set up these description systems that are really about identifying the different components of the breccia, separating and describing the class separate from the matrix, and then a range of different parameters around both how we describe the class and the matrix content. And then most importantly, we can look at the fabric, how those class and matrix interact with each other and what sort of fabrics they make and what sort of class arrangements they make. There are a number of different fabric arrangement classification systems we can use. This is the one that we often use. Um, we can look at crackle breaches where we've got little or no separation um, and it, of, the, of the clasts. And here's a, a bit of an example of what it looks like in core. Uh, so you can see here that the clasts are still touching each other. Once we get into the generation of, of a bit of a matrix, then um, these can actually either be matrix uh, class supported like this example or matrix supported. As in this example, you can see here that the class is sometimes still touching and the matrix supported, you can see that each of the class are completely surrounded by, a, in this case, a, a sandy clay matrix. And then we can get into our really highly chaotic and rotated breaches where we can see quite a lot of um, knocking off of the corners, the sharp angular corners of the clasps and they now are completely surrounded by a matrix and they've been disorientated and rotated. So there's been significant um, advanced level of, of the breachiation event. So when we're logging this core, we need to be able to identify these sort of textures and fabric arrangements because they can make a big difference to how they perform uh, once we start stressing these breaches in, the, in an open pit or, or an underground opening. There are a lot of difficulties in trying to describe these breaches. Um, the, the number one thing you need to remember is that Normally, these breaches are a result of multiple phases of a hydrothermal activity. So we've got repeated fracturing and breachiation, and 
Um, and often the same piece of ground can be uh, subject to different types of uh, free magmatic or uh, magmatic um, events. If your main data source is drilling, then it's very difficult to see these textural relationships at the core scale. And often when we're trying to log these things, that those um, matrix materials can often be washed away, particularly in those weakly cemented clay matrix uh, brexit types. The next type of difficulty with these breaches is, is trying to log RQ, RQD. Um, then because of their inherently weak nature, then they're very much subject to drilling and handling disturbance, um, which produces that artificial break in the core, so particularly in those crackle and mosaic breaches. And even uh, in those crackle breaches where we've got these incipient or weakly rehealed fractures, and they're, they can easily um, fracture during the coring and handling process. And the last difficulty um, is sometimes um, it is quite difficult to differentiate between what is a true hydrothermal breacher and what is actually a fault breacher. They can be um, uh, quite similar in appearance and character. And often what I find in my experience is that there's um, a lot of these breaches have been misinterpreted as fault breaches, whereas um, a lot of them are actually hydrothermal breacher. Uh, looking at different alteration zones, so this is the very typical, very simplified um, alteration system for, for, a, for a porphyry style deposit. But if we then relate that to Silito's model for a telescoped um, uh, porphyry system, under these porphyry systems, we have progressively younger alteration types as we go from depth to um, deeper in the system to shallower in the system, particularly with our uh, epithermal um, alteration types near the, near the surface. The, the thing that in, we need to bear in mind with these types of alteration models is that the um, shallower alteration zones are, are typically overprints. They overprint and partly reconstitute the deeper alteration types. So that um, I'll just talk a little bit about weathering next. Um, just, just bear in mind that um, we often get these overprinting uh, upper level weathering impacts due to that infiltration of the meteoric water. So we do have these oxidation and leaching of the upper systems producing the supergene enrichment. Uh, and of course, these weathering and alteration systems are um, are important to us because they produce substantial mineralogical changes to the original rock. Typically, it results in a degradation in the rock mass quality and in, often in the intact strength, but uh, you just need to be careful with that as a, um, as a rule of thumb because sometimes that can actually relate to it, an increase in rock mass quality or increase in rock and intact strength. Now, if we, if we hazard a guess at trying to rank the different alteration types in terms of their rock mass quality, so going from the best quality rocks up into the worst, the best quality at the bottom and the worst quality at the top. So our regional propylitic alteration types typically represent our, our best quality rock mass. Uh, once we start getting into the, in, into the middle of the parts of the porphyry system, we have our potassic leading into our phyllic alteration types. And normally uh, in our phyllic alteration types, that's uh, a result of a acid leaching process. And we can actually generate another type of brucciation, chemical brucciation uh, associated with that acid, acid leaching. And then often in those phyllic alteration types, and this is very typical in the Southeast Asia deposits, we get precipitation of anhydrite and then uh, dissolution to, to, to gypsum. So those anhydrite to gypsum boundaries are uh, represent a significant change in geotypical condition where we're getting um, much better quality rock below that boundary in the anhydrite material. 
Next factor um, I want to talk about at the deposit scale is these regional structural associations. So if you remember, we talked about the how a lot of these deposits are associated with these fault jogs and um, arc related structures. So we can get these pull apart basins, um, which are, can be both under pure strike slip motion, but also under ideally under transtensional pull apart basins. Now, if you look at the literature again, we can see these types of conceptual models and pull apart basins. We get these near parallel or terrace normal faults. Um, and in these transtensional pull apart systems, we have these um, normal faults arranged in a non echelon pattern. So these, if we understand and the, the big scale, big picture structural setting of our deposit, then we can start anticipating what we might see at the district scale with these um, pull apart type structures associated with these, um, the big faults that these mineralization systems are associated with. We should also look at the evolution of these systems. Are we in a young system? where these on echelon normal faults in these transtensional settings are relatively steep and planar. And then another, uh, once the, these uh, pull apart systems become uh, a bit older and a bit more evolved, and then the, the associated faulting in these systems can be get, get a lot more complex, including these uh, relay ramp structures through here, these cross basin faults through the middle of the basin, and very importantly, on the limits of the basin, we get these um, curved and less steep concave up um, normal faults. And of course, uh, internal to these pull apart systems, we can get these right or shear structures that most people are very familiar with. They are um, uh, synthetic and antithetic strike slip structures and then our normal faults at either end of the basin. If we look at it, intrusion related structures, uh, we can have these growth models related to tabular um, magma ch chambers, uh, producing these steep extensional faults in the roof above the pluton in the rock mass hosting the porphyry. And we can get these uh, concentric radial joint systems uh, associated in, in the rock mass surrounding the intrusion. Um, and the important factor here is that the, the potency for these concentric structures to um, flatten with depth, uh, which is an important characteristic we need to keep an eye out for. So when we're putting our structural model together, there's a few tools we can use to help us with that. Uh, the first one is the hierarchy of structures, and then we can classify our faults to try and give us a, a confidence and in uh, our interpretation of those faults. In a, in, a, in a relatively simple structural setting, we can just divide it into major structures and, and, and minor structures. So the major structures are our faults and shears that operate at the interamp to overall slope scale and our joints and um, more discrete shears that operate just at the beep scale. One thing, things get a little bit more complex. We need to be, um, uh, more sophisticated in how we classify our faults. We can divide them into different primary, secondary, and tertiary order structures. And we can gauge that by the degree of clay gouge and crutch breacher development and the width of the associated damage zone uh, relating to faulting. When we come to classify our faults, normally we have different data sources to help with that. We might have some LIDAR or air photo linear analysis. We have, um, might have some mapping that we could do in uh, surface exposures and, and our, our very typical data sources drilling. So we can give them a yes, no, with or without type rating for each of those different data sources. And then the different mix, wherever we see the fault in all three, we can see them as linear, we can see them in outcrop, we can see them in borehole core. Uh, we can give these different combinations of data classification a medium and high or low descriptor. And that gives us uh, a basis for 
we're making an assessment as to, okay, which faults are we going to take into account in design and which ones we're not? Because if they're, I've got a low confidence, it, um, depending on the, uh, the risk profile of the project, then we might not want to take these, these low or even sometimes medium um, confidence faults and in, through into design. So the key questions we need to ask at the deposit scale is, is about the distribution of the brucciation and how that relates to the basic geological architecture of the deposit. We need to look at the alteration model. We need to look at weathering. Uh, we need to understand the deposit scale faults and shears and how they may relate to these regional structures. And we need to look at the structures related to the intrusion event. And then the, the, the last thing you need to bear in mind is that the deformation processes that can occur after mineralization. Um, so uh, the structural history over printing the regional and intrusion related um, structural patterns. So if we quickly have a look at a couple of rock mass uh, a couple of examples. This is an example of a porphyry system in the Philippines. It's situated on the flank of an uplifted and eroded strato volcanic complex. So here's the volcanic complex here, and our porphyry deposits located on the southeastern corner of this um, old volcano. It um, there are, it's a, a a diorite stock that has come through into intruded into the andesite. Um, lava flow systems. And there's a number of different brecciation types that we've been able to identify in the rock mass for, as part of the pit slope design. Uh, we have a vertically zoned alteration system and then we also do have a gypsum and hydride transition at depth. Now this, this is the alteration model for the deposit. You can see that it's quite complex, um, but it captures both the porphyry and the high soft wadation nickel thermal alteration types and, and through here is, is represents that gypsum and hydride transition such. That, so I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but um, this is very typical of the type of alteration models that um, they get generated in, um, for these porphyry systems. We can utilize that to help us with our rock mass classification. And this is the rock mass units that we uh, derive for this unit. I'll go for a couple of examples. So this is an example of these clay bridges. Um, in this case, you can see that the matrix supported with numerous shared zones. Uh, and these, uh, because we found it difficult to differentiate um, in some instances, the difference between the hydrothermal and the fault bridges, we've given it um, uh, so it relates to both the faulting and the hydrothermal activity. Um, as we go up in rock mass quality, we're in a highly fractured rock, still with very low RQD. Although you can see here, you can imagine that there is a bit of drill damage in that core. Uh, and then we can get up, once we get below the hydrite gypsum boundary, you can see how the rock mass quality increases substantially with high to moderate um, RQD. And if we, when we model that in section, uh, this is quite a complex model. We've been able to identify these interbanded, highly, um, highly fractured and hydrothermally brecciated zone. We've got Pacific hydrothermal breccia zones. We've got um, discreetly modeled fault zones. So we're about to identify the different types of bridge types and model them in section. And then we can um, generate some uh, finite element models to try and identify um, which of these zones are, are going to be critical for instability and in design. In this case, you can see here that this uh, hydrothermal bridge band that we've modeled through here as well as um, you can see some displacement occurring along the fault as well. So um, if we move on to a, a structural model example, this is the Grassberg pit um, up in the province of Papua in, in Indonesia. So this is on the Western side of the island of New Guinea. 
This is the original structural domain model, and you can clearly see that it's a radially produced model, which is very much focused on these intrusion related structures, the uh, concentric jointing in this case, as you can see in this bench scale photograph here. But when you look at the regional setting and the district scale setting of the grass bedding deposit, you can see that um, that is actually hosted by um, in a pull apart basin separated by two major strike split fault systems, the Merionvale fault system through here and the Erzberg fault system through here. So a very clear pull apart um, structural setting. And then we can start theorizing different types of regional structures associated with this pull apart setting. Um, both uh, pull apart basin features and aridal shears as well as the already identified intrusion related structures here, in particular, these, um, these concentric joints that um, were actually demonstrated to shallow at depth. So that was the original model. And this is the model that we ended up with to update the model. Then to take account of that pull apart setting in the district of the deposit scale uh, faults that were mapped in the early stages of mining. So you can see quite an uplift in the understanding of, of the structure um, as we brought in that conceptual understanding into the model. So just starting to wrap up now. Um, the last now gone through different the different components of the model, um, but particularly the rock mass in the structure. How do they actually impact on the fatty modes? And this is a survey that we did a number of years ago for, for an open pit in Indonesia. Uh, we uh, can't remember how many failures we surveyed, but it was um, uh, around 100 odd uh, at different scales from bench up to multiple bench to interamp scale. It, the telling figure here is that nearly 90% of the failures that we surveyed in this pit the structure was the dominant control. Now we can divide that up into these green. These are the, the structures that were failures that related to simple daylighting either as a planar slider or a wedge failure. 10% of these failures were some sort of complex structure where there's a number of or several different structures interacting to produce the failure geometry. And then 40% of the failures we're at some sort of mix between rock mass and structure, but structure still playing a dominant role. Only 11% of the failures are actually associated with, uh, not associated with structure uh, as a circular or semi-rotational style failure. And these occurred in these really highly altered and highly weathered rocks, um, particularly up the top of the, of the, um, in the upper parts of the pit walls. So very clearly structure is, is very important to the model and perhaps underrepresented in how we, uh, in the way that we're actually modeling these porphyry deposits. So I guess what my, my main takeaway point here from this talk is that the structure is really is a key component of the porphyry and epithermal model. Uh, is that it really is often or normally the dominant control on the failure mechanisms that we need to take account in stability and design. So uh, we need to put more emphasis on developing the structural model. Um, and the, the geotechnical model is not just about classifying the rock mass using RMR and GSI. Uh, the rock mass model is not um, just about adopting the resource geological model. We've got a complex interaction going on here between the original lithology, bridgeation, alteration, weathering and structure. And that's really our role is to unravel that complexity um, into the different rock mass units. And, and the, really the key way to do that is the development of that conceptual model. Every model must have a purpose and must have an objective. And it, when we go and do our site investigation, do our drilling and our mapping and our laboratory testing, it really should be designed against a series of questions, a series of hypotheses. We're practicing the scientific method here. We, and to do that, we need to develop that pic, big picture understanding um, 
compile some sort of geological history to help explain the timing of geological events that are impacting on the, the, the rock, rock mass that we're trying to engineer in. And then we need to have this, <clears throat> this feedback and um, uh, this feedback loop so that every time we cycle through our, from our pre-feasibility feedback that our understanding back into our conceptual model, update and improve our conceptual understanding update the list of questions in which the feasibility investigation should be addressing. Uh, and that, that cycling through the different mine development stages uh, is critical to uh, improving our geotechnical model. Um, and, and the reason for this approach is very simple. In, this, in these types of geological settings, that there are going to, always going to be gaps and uncertainties in the model. If you think about the percentage of sampling of the rock mass that we undertake, it is very small. So we don't get to see everything. So we need to be able to make judgments. And we need to use our experience when we're making decisions and, and analysis and design. And the best way to do that is to have that, um, have that conceptual model as, as a basis for us to allow us to make those, those judgments and, and use our experience. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening today. And we're going to, we got time for questions. We've got time for questions. Yep. Okay. Yep. Do you want me to read that? Okay. Great. Very good. I've got, I've got some help in the room with me. I've got a, a producer and a director. <laughs> so, um, the first question, I've prepared myself a couple of little questions. I'm allowed to say that, aren't I? Brilliant. I think my anticipation on the questions would be that um, nowadays it's, uh, it's important that you know, everybody wants a 3D model, right? Back, back in the early days when I started my career, we had to develop our models in a 2D section. Um, and the mind designers require the the, our uh, flat design parameters is block models so that they can import that into their optimization as simple as possible. So how do we actually compile that 3D model, particularly when we've got this complexity of, of controls in the rock mass units? As I said, it's usually not sufficient just to take the resource model into account. Um, as a proxy, as a 100% as proxy for our geotechnical model. So the, the best way to do that is to look at the dominant control. Um, and typically in these types of deposits, the alteration is, is a great control, is, is uh, an important control, the impacts, the overprinting of alteration on the original rock type. Um, so we can use the alteration model, resource model as, as a starting point. But then we need to adjust that, adjust it for the different brecciation types that occur in the, the rock mass. Um, and if there's any damage zones associated with the major faulting that we can isolate. And then often there's a, a weathering or oxidation surface um, at the, uh, as part of the geological model we can use as well. So we can start with the particular important elements of the resource model as a proxy. Um, and the reason why, but you just can't, but that needs to be adjusted for all those other controls that uh, take into account. But given that the amount of geotechnical drilling that we have um, and to sample the rock mass is so low, we often do need to fall back on the resource drilling, um, the cord resource drilling. So we need to look at the core photos, we need to look at the geological logs and um, make an interpretation on these different factors to try and uh, update and, um, and the, the wireframes in the block models uh, rather than just um, take the alteration or the lithology model uh, verbatim. Um, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so the next uh, a question from the floor, do you use a lot of drone imagery to make the models? Um, yes, 
we do. The, I guess if you're doing a pre-feasibility or a feasibility style, um, so model where your mining hasn't started, you're a greenfields deposit, then uh, LIDAR becomes, becomes a major uh, and important data source. So flying some LIDAR uh, and you, typically the, in the Southeast Asia deposits are uh, the highly vegetated. So you need a fairly, uh, a fairly dense sample in the LIDAR survey to be able to penetrate that canopy and get enough, enough hits on the ground to build us a LIDAR model. Now the reason for the LIDAR model is to support our lineament uh, analysis. Um, of course, uh, drones become important when we're mapping uh, once mining started and we've got some, um, some exposures and benches to map. My preference would be to try and map them, what I call manual mapping, because you can actually get up close and personal to the structure and to the rock mass. But um, uh, with health and safety rules nowadays, it's not always possible to do that. So to get safe access to the benches, so drones become uh, an important part of uh, the data collection. Uh, next question, any chance to use a quantitative approach? Absolutely. And that's the reliability part of the, um, of the looking at the reliability of the model and looking at our understanding um, and our confidence levels is, is an important part to try and um, really trying to, trying to match that with the, um, the risk level at which the, um, they wanted to, that the, uh, the client or the, um, the, the developer, the, the mining company wishes to take into, into their design. That, and that's normally framed around the type of risk, their appetite for risk in, for the pit development and also the overall um, mining development. So uh, quantitative approach is a great way that requires, um, when we're trying to quantify our parameters in their geotechnical model, it requires a sufficient amount of laboratory testing to be able to do that, um, to be able to understand the uh, different probability distributions for the different strength types. Okay, one last question. Uh, Given the message that structure is a key component, what is the best way to compile the structure model for slope design? Great question. Um, the reason for that, the reason why, hopefully I demonstrated to you in that example that how important structure is. And, I, and my, my comment would be that there's probably, um, in current practice in these porphyry and epithermal deposits, there's a note, am I allowed to say an overemphasis on the on the rock mass component and the rock mass characterization? I'm not trying to say that's not important, it is, but it's often at the expense of not putting the effort into the structural model. So we and as I've tried to demonstrate that the structural model is is often the most important part of the geotechnical model. And perhaps the structural model is the least um, well-developed component of the model in, in current practice. Now, often the, um, the, the resource model will include a, a, a structural component to, to the geological model. Uh, so that is a good starting point for compiling our structural model. But the, um, you just have to bear in mind that the main customer of the resource model is to try, or the main objective is to try and explain mineralization and grade. And not all of those structures that are in the resource structural model would be geotechnically significant. They, you know, they might be subject to late phase. Um, yep. Yep. Do you want me to keep going or do you want me to stop? <laughs> I'm happy to keep going, but. I'll, I'll finish up very quickly. Just be careful adopting the resource model because the structural model, because the, all of them, if we had a late phase alteration event, they might be rehealed and not geotechnically significant. And then secondly, because of that, not all of the geotechnically relevant structures might be in the resource structural model. The, um, therefore, you can't just take the resource structural model and apply it to the geological model for slope design. You do still need to put some effort into understanding. Um, and once again, uh, to fill the gaps, 
because of our the limited amount of geotechnical drilling, you need to often fall back on the resource diamond drilling program and go for the core photographs and go for the geological logs to improve that structural model. Um, okay, I think we're, we're all done here. So thank you very much for, for listening today. Um, I hope you're able to get some, um, some understanding on how to improve your geotechnical modeling for slope design, and but also for underground mine design and these porphyry and epithermal style deposits. Um, uh, we, we often have people that like to send questions through. So do they have a um, uh, email address? We can provide an email address. You can send an email. Yep. Um, so if you send us an email, and we can reply to those questions. This, this talk was originally, a version of this talk was originally given back in 2016 at the uh, Asia Pacific Slope Stability and Mining Conference, which was in Brisbane, 2016. Uh, so the, I do have a paper on this um, topic. We can provide you the reference for that, or uh, maybe even a PDF copy. Um, but, um, you know, that was for us. For um, for six years ago. So we've updated some of our thinking since then. So um, our, the idea is to, to try and uh, update that paper and, and publish it again, and probably in a journal. Um, all right, I think we're wrapping it up now. Thanks very much. And um, I look forward to the next PSM webinar. Thank you.